uh, on Wednesday nights, uh, I've been doing a, a theological just kind of walkthrough uh, on heaven. And uh, I've, I've been using Randy Alcorn's book on heaven as, as a primary resource. So you can pick that up if you want to follow along. Um, we are, tonight we're going to, we're going to dive into some of the specifics about the, the city of the new heavenly Jerusalem, all right? And so you have to be fair to me in that if, if we wade out into some area that is just a little uncertain, and I give you particular interpretations, uh, be gracious with that because none of us know, all right? And uh, particularly with uh, apocalyptic literature, uh, it's very difficult to figure out when to take things literally and when to take things figuratively and how to apply those. Um, so with that said, last time I looked at, and I wanted to show you a particular thread where much in uh, the Bible uh, points to our end final state as a restoration of Eden. That is that we should look back at the way that Eden was, this perfect garden-like, perfect nature-like state, back walking with God in the cool of the day, okay? Uh, and so we did that last time, uh, but today I want to show you that there's another analogy uh, that the scripture points us to that it is actually different than Eden, and it is the fact that um, we are to look forward to the new Jerusalem as a city, not Eden, but a city. And uh, when we get to Revelation 21 and 22, and we use some of that description, one of the things that I want to press is I think we're supposed to take much of this section on the new city as literal as we can in some instances. And the reason is, is because there are other spots in the scripture that point us towards the heavenly city and they are absolutely literal, okay? So in the book of Hebrews, it actually happens a number of times. Listen to Hebrews chapter 11. Listen to eight through 10. By faith... Abraham, when he was called, he obeyed by going out of a place to which uh, that he had received for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was to go. He's, he's talking about way back in Genesis when God said to Abraham, get up and go to the land that I'm going to show you, right? So Abraham left his home. He left his inheritance there to go to a new land, okay? By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob and fellow heirs of that same promise, for he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Okay, skip down to verses 13 through 15. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they were seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, right, they could have had opportunity to go right back to it. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. What is that talking about? You see, Abraham sojourned the land. It wasn't that they were just getting the land of Israel. But as the author of Hebrews points out here, he's going to point out again in chapter 12, verse 22, and again in 13, 14, that Abraham was seeking the heavenly Jerusalem, the city that's going to come down at the end when God makes all things new, when heaven and earth become one. As you dive into the very end of scripture, 
Uh, not only are we to picture that the whole new earth has been restored and refreshed, that all of the new earth is like Eden, okay? It is that perfect place again, all right? And for those of you that are very nature-oriented, you're like drinking it up. You're like, I'm gonna take walks in the woods and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have nature trails and it's gonna be awesome, all of those things. But... The scripture simultaneously then begins to say, but the new city, the new city of Jerusalem descends from heaven. The last two chapters, a city that we are supposed to take, I think in a very literal sense, again, because I told you other spots, and it's not just these spots, there are other spots in scripture that point to this looking for the heavenly city. Okay, now, there's, there's a lot of details. I'm going to come back to this next week and we'll flesh out some of these. Uh, but one of the things as you begin to get the description of the new city is we'll begin with its magnificent dimensions. Okay, in Revelation 21, 15, and 16, we are told that an angel measures the city. Okay, and its length and its width are the same. It is a square, but its height is the same also. It is a cube. We will come back to that in just a second. Now, these dimensions are given in very whole numbers, like numbers that you expect in the book of Revelation. So the number that's given here, your Bible, English Bible, probably translates it into miles because you don't know what a stadia is. It's about 600 feet, but it gives the dimension in 12,000 stadia. All right, when we're comprehending what, that, what the dimension of that is, right, that is, that is like 14,000 miles, sorry, 1,400 miles, okay? 1,400 miles. That, to, to grasp, uh, that is two-thirds of the United States, Okay, so when you think of, think of Canada all the way to Mexico and the Appalachian Mountains all the way to California, okay, that's 1,400 miles, okay? Think of that in a square, okay? All of that distance as the new Jerusalem comes down. This is the capital city. This is where Jesus reigns. And it is magnificent, okay? There's lots of vivid descriptions about it. Um, but the first is, is the massive size of it. Then it also says that the height is the same as well. Now, undoubtedly, this is a pointer, a reminder to, there's only one cube in the whole of Scripture, and that is in the Holy of Holies, Okay, so undoubtedly, the city's dimensions give us an idea. They remind us of the fact that God's presence will be everywhere. There's no temple in it because God is everywhere. We dwell in the holy of holies, if you will. Uh, earlier in the book of Revelation, it said you will be a pillar in the temple of God. That's, that's because you're supposed to imagine what it's going to be like for you to be it's so in God's presence, it's like you're in the Holy of Holies, okay? But the question for commentators and for you as we ponder is, did God construct the Holy of Holies so that way, so that it was pointing forward to the new Jerusalem? Or is, the new, is this just a description backwards or is this also a description forwards? In other words, are we supposed to take that the city is literally as you know, wide as I told you, the Appalachian Mountains to California and Canada to Mexico, this massive city that comes down when God makes all things new and it is simultaneously that tall? you imagine the number of layers on this city? Right? I mean, you can fit billions of people in a city that size. Okay, it's, it's fun to think about. <laughs> Pastor, I don't know. I don't know. 
But I'll tell you this. This is what I do know. There are a few descriptions. It talks about the gates. There's going to there's gonna be 12 gates, three on each side. And uh, it says that, that the nations and the kings, they go out, in and out of the gates. Now, this suggests that not everyone lives in the city. Or, or maybe you have two homes, all right? This is what I'm proposing. You got two homes, all right? You got one in the city and one out. But the nations, it says the nations go out and they come in, okay? Now, why this is so important, in, uh, in Revelation 18 or 19, uh, when, when Babylon, the great city, falls, there is, there is all this lamenting over all the beauty and the good and the trades and the arts and everything that, that man has accomplished, but he got off track and he began to worship the things of this world instead of God. But in the new Jerusalem, in the new heaven and new earth, right? Think of what it's going to be like in that city with all the nations and all the arts and all the technology and, and all the, the good and righteous things that don't get out of kilter but are magnificent because we like to build and we like to sing and we like to uh, create music and art and beauty. And think of, think of the shows that are going to be there. Think of, the, uh, think of the music concerts that are going to be there when you finally learn Mandarin. And uh, think of, uh, think of the, the sporting events and all the good things that are going to be in this city. And I think that we're, we're going to keep playing in this space. I'm out of time. But for tonight, just, just to introduce and to allow your mind to, to think, what is that city going to be like when all is right, when all the nations are represented all the cultures, that's the beauty of the end. You see, the end doesn't go back to the, uh, to the plain Jane of the beginning. It actually fast forwards and incorporates the, the complexity of nations and tongues and different cultures being together, still having their culture, but because of Jesus Christ, we're all in harmony. And to be able to play that out it's going to be awesome. It's going to be greater than you and I could ever imagine. And, and it is good and it is right for us to not only think back to Eden like we did last week, but to also think forward to that city. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Help us as we think through the complexity of what's symbolism and what's not, um, and, and to think about a place that, that you have prepared for us, just for us, that will delight our heart. You are a father who loves to give good gifts to your children. You've made us with with bodies uh, and taste buds, and, and we love to do activity and work and all of those things, and, and to just think and to dream of our eternal home with you, uh, sometimes in nature and sometimes in a city. God, help us to think well and write about that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys.